Let me ask you, do any of these sound familiar to you while you're making music? Frustration, overwhelm, and analysis paralysis? Something missing in your music? Having trouble writing good hooks and good parts? Not being able to finish your tracks and your arrangements? Amateur sounding productions? Not being able to get a pro sounding mix or people not listening to your music? Your music doesn't get a reaction? But what if I told you that all of these problems are simply symptoms of an underlying issue, an underlying cause? All right, so in this video, we're gonna go over why having the wrong creative process can actually be the cause underneath all of these super common music making struggles. Hey yo, what's up? It's Alex from Metamind Music. And in this video, I wanna talk about one of the most important things when it comes to making your own music, if not the most important thing, when you think about producing your own pro quality stuff from your home studio, and that is your creative process. I wanna walk through this model of the creative process that I have called Workflow Wizardry, and I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen to show it to you. And if you want to grab this Notion template, so you can download this and use it for yourself and your own music or follow along, you can find it in a link below this video. This first part is just some admin stuff to get this set up so you can use it for yourself. But I'm just gonna go ahead and scroll down here to the actual workflow wizardry part and use this to talk through what the heck I'm even talking about, about the creative process. So let's pop this open and get this show on the road. So what is workflow wizardry? So in essence, a quote that captures this is that art is not a thing it's a way, okay? So when you think about being a musician, being a producer, being an artist, it's not really a thing you do. It becomes part of your identity. It becomes part of a way of being in which you create that art, okay? And the real secret behind this process is that it's not a secret, pretty meta, right? Well, the whole idea behind this is that it follows universal principles behind creativity or the creative process. So if you're thinking of making music or designing a building with architecture or chiseling some marble with sculpture, they all follow specific stages of transformation. So a super helpful analogy to think about the creative process and how it ties to producing music, making music, composing music, all that great stuff is to think about making wine. Okay, so when you make wine, you can think of the process as having different stages, right? And each stage of the process contributes to you being able to do the next stage a lot more easily, and they all have a specific focus. So with making wine, the first stage is to pick your grapes, right? So before you even start doing anything with your wine, you have to identify what kind of wine are you making? Is it going to be red wine or sparkling wine or a white wine? And what kind of grapes are going to help you create that vision? So it's the same thing with music, right? Like before you make music, there has to be some sort of vision as to what direction you're going, like what genre, what instruments you're going to use, what emotion do you want to convey? What story do you want to tell? All of those things parallel just picking your grapes so that you can actually start the process. And then continuing with the winemaking, from there you take those grapes and you mash it all together. It gets all messy and you you know, barefoot in the barrel and you're crushing all these grapes together and it's getting messy. Then moving on, you extract the juice. So then from that pulp, you kind of just like get all the good stuff. You get the juice out of what you mash together and you're filtering out all the like garbage and like twigs and pulp that you don't want so that you have a purified juice at the end. Moving on, you then combine your ingredients. Maybe you add some other fruits. Maybe you add some cinnamon. Maybe you add some nutmeg, a little bit of sugar, whatever it is. You combine your ingredients, your secret family recipe to make that wine. If you continue forward, then you ferment it. So then it sits there for a super long time and it just almost transforms itself into a whole other thing. It goes from grape juice, right, to alcohol, to fermented wine, and it changes its actual anatomy. It changes into a different form, and that's what fermenting the wine does. It purifies, it changes its form, and it takes a while, right? And then you move on to purifying the wine. So you take that 
alcohol and you purify it even more. You make it as perfect as you can get it so that it has a bouquet of flavor and it actually does what you want it to do, right? It has a great effect to whoever tastes your wine. And then finally, you bottle your wine. You put it in a place, in a medium, so that other people can experience it, right? So if you're selling it or if you're sharing it with friends, it has to be bottled in a way so that whoever experiences that wine hopefully has a good experience, so it's consistent. And also, it's in a bottle, right? So you're not like giving it with your hands or like trying to scoop it and give it to people. It's in a vessel that you can trade with other people or give to other people. So I'm sure that as I walk through that, you can see how with making music and music production, we follow the same stages, okay? It's just with music. So we're gonna get into each of those stages as we move forward, but just keep that in mind is that there are different stages to progressing your music from the very first ideas you have all the way to a finished master that you can share on Spotify, put on a CD, etc. So if we continue here, you can see that, like I said, every stage of winemaking plays an essential role in making amazing tasting wine. And you can already start to guess what happens if one of those stages aren't done properly or aren't done as good as they could have been. There are issues that start happening. And if we flip back to music now, when we have the wrong process or a non-functional creative process, as I like to call it, we run into all the common music making struggles. And I've talked to a lot of musicians, a lot of producers, and these problems come up again and again and again when I have conversations with people. And these problems are things like I mentioned at the beginning. All of these problems, believe it or not, are actually symptoms of an underlying cause. And this is so important because these stages are universal and within them, what you do inside of them are infinitely variable. Okay. But there's still a fact that you have to go through these stages to get something from beginning to end. And the key is that as you progress through these stages, you have to have a process that works specifically for you. Okay. Because nobody else is the same as you. Everybody does art and makes music in different ways. You might play an instrument, you might be a DJ, you might be a DAW wizard, you might work with EDM, you might be a rocker, right? You might be a singer songwriter, you might be a vocalist. All of those things will influence your strengths and your weaknesses and also have a different creative process that you will need for it to make sense for you, but you will still have to use these stages, okay? So that's why we're gonna go through these stages and start to think about how you can make these stages your own to build your own creative process. Workflow wizardry here that we're gonna go over in just a sec is just a model of the creative process, okay? It's just a way that I've learned it and that I like to describe it, but these are universal principles. Okay, so the whole intention is that you take this and you shape it and refine it and you reimagine it for your own personal style so that you can actually see where maybe your blind spots are right now and what you can focus on to avoid all of those problems that we covered earlier. So I'm just going to click outside this card and move over to stage one, clarify. Okay, so this stage is very much summarized well by this quote that says the enemy of art is the absence of limitations. Let that sit for a while. The enemy of art is the absence of limitations. So in other words, when we don't have limitations, we are actually working against our creativity. Okay. We're actually making it difficult to create art when there's no limitations. So if we continue down here, the, the problem that this stage fo focuses on and what it solves is that option overwhelm, okay? When you look at the DAW and there's like a zillion samples, you have like a zillion different instruments, there's every direction in the world to go. Different tempos, different time signatures, different keys, different scales, different time rhythms, you name it. There's an infinite amount of possibilities and it can be paralyzing, right? You can stare at a DAW and just be like, I don't know what to do. I'm overwhelmed. This also helps you avoid rabbit holes. So this is like going down, scrolling presets, changing the snare sample, EQing the snare just to see if it sounds different. Like that's a rabbit hole that's not actually progressing you forward. And generic sounding music. If your music sounds like 
AI could have created it, <laughs> then there's a problem, right? And that's probably because there hasn't been enough intentional limitations set. And we'll get more into that in just a sec. The focus of the stage is to set an intention, set a vision. Okay. Like what are you trying to do? What are you trying to make? What are you trying to convey? If you're experimenting, what are you experimenting with? Right? So that's something to think about. You're reducing your possibilities and you're preparing your instruments. Okay. And this can work for, again, whatever genre you're working in. If you're a guitarist or a player, the fact that you play an instrument is already a huge limitation. It's a huge strength. But if you think about it, a guitar or a piano or a drum set only has a certain world of things you can do within it. And there's a lot you can do within it, but you can't do everything. Versus like, if you look at a DAW, a DAW can do pretty much any sound under the sun. If you mostly work in a DAW, you may have to limit things a little bit more intentionally. One of the biggest problems that people face, they're like, I don't know what to focus on next. I don't know how to get started. Or if you lose momentum throughout the process, if you start off good and you get a loop going, but then you don't know where to go, that's because maybe there's something missing in this stage. My studio around me, I've set it up to be an extension of me as an artist, okay? It's not just a bunch of stuff. I use them in a very particular way to do what I do. And I would encourage you to think of your setup in the same way. It wants to be something that's expressive, something that you can play nuanced performances with. You can get a lot of different sounds, a lot of different moods and atmospheres within it by playing it. And it wants to be articulated in a multitude of ways. So you can do many different things with it. So like if you think of a piano again, or a guitar, there's a lot of different things you can do with those instruments. And if you're designing your own instruments, you want to keep that in mind to make it narrow, but have a wide amount of things that it can do, sounds that it can create. Okay. And setting those intentional creative constraints will help you find freedom in those limitations. Okay. So if you've ever heard somebody say that more options is better for creativity, that's completely false. Okay. Because if you think about it, who's actually more creative, somebody who has 200 tracks to make something sound good or someone who has 10 tracks. Okay. So let's move on to the next stage. Number two, flow. Okay. This is another great quote. The intuitive mind is a sacred gift and the rational mind is a faithful servant. We have created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. And I'm not going to get into society and the education system and that whole thing, but just know this, that our society very much honors what is called the rational mind, logic, planning, schedule, right? Order. And that is very useful. We need it. It's part of us, but in art, we need to develop our intuitive mind as well. So that's kind of what this stage is focused on, channeling your inner genius. So the problem that this stage focuses on solving is not feeling inspired, having trouble expressing yourself, hitting writer's block, okay? If you've ever experienced any of those problems, let me know in the comments down below, but it's because we're not tapping in to what is called the intuitive mind. Okay, we're, we're thinking too much. And uh, the focus of the stage is to enter flow state, to improvise and jam. And 100% you've experienced flow before. You know, when you're in the studio for like two, three hours and they just flew by, and you don't know where the time went. That's most likely because you were in flow state. Okay, and the whole idea behind this stage is to let go of your inhibitions and to dissolve in the music. Okay, to tap into that inner child. Because if you think about it, if you give a kid a push two with a sound loaded on it, they would just play it. <laughs> they wouldn't be thinking about what they're doing. They would just start touching pads and turning knobs and having fun. And that's what we want to tap into in this stage. And the reason is that once we get that conscious mind out of the way, once we get those expectations out of the way, once we get those quality judgments out of the way for now, and we just focus on simply creating, you will create a huge amount of ideas. You're going to stop having your foot on the brake and the gas at the same time where you're creating something and then editing it and then judging it and not feeling good about yourself. You're not worried about any of that. You're just focusing on creating as much as you can with the stuff you designed in stage one. And the key to this is that you're not allowed to judge or edit your ideas. 
Okay, you are not allowed. Play a game with yourself. Just allow yourself to play and see what happens. And you would be surprised at the power of happy accidents. Okay. I personally have gotten so many cool ideas from things that I would never have thought of in a million years. And that points again towards what can happen when you put yourself through the stage and when you tap into your unconscious and you're not thinking of your ideas. Okay, and then from there, you're going to have a massive amount of ideas. That's the whole goal is to get a ton of ideas, okay? And to not worry about if they're good or bad at this point. And then that's going to set us up for the next stage, okay? So again, clarify was pulling back the arrow, right? Holding back and then flow is releasing and just letting it, letting it go and see what happens. Okay, so let's go to stage three. Extract. Again, this quote describes this perfectly. The best way to have a good idea is to have a lot of ideas. Okay, and this is the idea of curating quality. Okay, which means you're getting quality by creating a ton of quantity. And the reason why that that's the best way is because at any particular point in time when you're working on an idea or a certain track, our judgments and our opinions, our quality judgments about how good or bad the thing is, are not reliable. Okay, our opinion changes depending on our mood, depending on the time of day, depending how we feel, and our music tastes also change. Like one day you might be in the mood for this song, but the other day you might like this kind of genre music, but that doesn't mean anything necessarily about the quality of the music itself. Okay, so finding the gold, the problem that this stage is focused on solving is that something missing in your music. If you're getting stuck in a loop, if you can arrange like 16 bars, but you can't progress it forward, or if you're wasting your time on bad ideas, which is horrible because it's disheartening if you're working on something that just isn't good <laughs> and you're trying to like mix and master a song that's not really that good. And then the focus again is quality through quantity. Okay. Through doing a lot of repetitions, getting a lot of ideas, and then looking at them later by comparing a lot of different ideas, you're going to be able to see the best ones really quickly. And a ton of pro producers and pro artists, pro musicians will finish more music then they release. They only release the best stuff from a bunch of stuff they've created. Um, we're also focusing on identifying the best ideas to match that vision and then shaping, refining, and developing. So once you have a handful of awesome ideas, you can play around with expanding the motif, developing the idea, trying maybe a different baseline or a different way to express that idea. The stage is about identifying what is good and what matches your vision. Okay, you might have ideas that are great, but don't fit the vibe of the song. They don't fit the vision of the song. So you can always save those ideas for later. But this stage is when you actually decide, does this contribute to the song? Does this contribute to the other ideas I have that are good? Or is it taking away? And then also just removing the stuff that isn't because we're going to create a ton of stuff that honestly is crap, which is okay. It's all part of the process, but there's going to be stuff that just isn't up to snuff. Okay, so that's super important to remember. If you've ever been stuck in hyper-focusing on one track, on one loop, and trying everything under the sun to move it forward, and you're stressing yourself out, and you've listened to it hundreds of times, that's the problem, okay? is because we need to be working on many ideas and changing our focus so that we can have a better picture as to what is actually aligning itself with a vision that we have and what is actually good. Okay, so we're going to review your material from the last stage, and then you're going to reintegrate it with your refined creation. And always remember, you won't necessarily use everything you've created. And this is the time to judge. Now you take out your editor. Now you take out the critic. Now you take out the quality judgments. And you're like, this has to be fixed. This sucks. I like this, but this has to change about it. This is awesome. This could be the chorus. Scratch the rest. So this is where that editor comes in. Whereas in the last stage, we were putting them aside to focus on the creator. Okay. And then by doing this, then you're primed. You're ready to start thinking about composing a song because you have really good ideas that you've vetted and you've contemplated how they fit together and maybe develop some motifs. Now you're in a good position to move to the next stage. So let's actually do that. 
boom, compose. I love this quote, super trippy, but I love it. Music is liquid architecture and architecture is frozen music. Just think about that for a second. So what makes an impactful song? Okay, you can see this little image I have here, the yin and yang of dynamics. So soft versus loud, sparse versus full, sustained versus rhythmic, upfront versus distant. That within there lies the secret in arranging a great song or having a great shape to a track, telling a story, all of those things. And the problem that this phase focuses on is obviously boring songs, like having lackluster arrangements, getting stuck arranging tracks, which is a huge problem with a lot of us, and not finishing projects, all right? Not getting stuff past the finish line because we were not happy with an arrangement. And the focus is to put parts into a timeline. So now that you have good parts that you've, again, vetted that are good, you can start putting them in a timeline and see how they affect each other in time. And you want to arrange a track by focusing on these elements, right? The dynamics of a shape or a story throughout the track. And you want to emphasize tension and release. And the reason is that music at its core, if you really think about it, music at its core is about expressing tension and release. The contrast, opposites, ebb and flow, telling a story, uncertainty versus certainty, playing with expectations, the push and pull. The unification of opposites is really what tells a story in music. And many producers know how to come up with a good loop, but struggle to arrange a full song that is impactful. Okay. And again, having gone through the last three stages, clarify, flow, and extract, at this point, you're going to have enough material to start a composition. And a lot of people, they jump the gun on this. They'll like write a piece of music as you go. And you can do this, right? You can, you can do any which way that works for you with this process. But a lot of the time, just working from left to right to try and write a whole song can be very difficult versus if you have five or six really good ideas that you know already work together and they have the same vibe, then it's gonna become a lot easier to arrange a song, right? And again, this is when the project transforms from maybe a bunch of different scattered ideas to bringing it to one time-bound musical journey with the beginning, middle, and end. Always thinking about songwriting and storytelling, a journey, a shape, all of those kinds of cues can be very helpful to think about arranging an impactful song. Because like, if you think of your favorite show or your favorite movies or anything that hooks you and like drives that anticipation, it's usually because of the contrasting of opposites or playing with your expectations. You're not sure what's going to happen or it's pulling your ear somewhere. So that's something super handy to think about when you're composing a track. So then from there, you move on to the edit stage. All right. So let's move on to edit. And this stage is usually the longest stage, depending on what kind of music, of course. Like if you're just making acoustic music with the vocals, you probably don't need to edit a ton. If you're tracking like a whole prog rock, hard rock band, it's going to take some editing and a lot more thorough attention on this. Or if you're doing something that's like mostly edited audio tricks in the DAW, then you're going to be spending most of your time here, right? And this stage is all about shaping and refining a pro production. So the problem, again, is getting those tracks past the finish line. Also, amateur sounding productions. If you feel like your productions don't sound up to snuff or they don't stand shoulder to shoulder with some of your favorite artists, a lot of people start thinking about, oh, it's the mix, it's the master. And I would say that before that, it's your song. Okay, if your song is awesome, that's a great first step. But the next one is the edit phase and how much attention to detail you've put in to really expanding it and making it breathe and putting all your parts together, telling a story with the actual track itself. The focus of this stage is editing what needs to be fixed, refining the gold and enhancing the gold. Okay, so whatever the hook and the big part of your song, the climax and where the attention of the listener wants to be, you wanna enhance that. And then finalizing your track before mixing it. Okay, that's super important. So once you get to compose, so once you've gone through the first four phases, a super powerful thing to think about is the idea of recycling. Okay, because most likely once you've composed a track, it's gonna still need some work. 
You're going to notice stuff about it, and it might not be quite as good as you first thought when you're on that dopamine high. And you're like, oh, this has to be better. I'm not sure about this part. Start second-guessing yourself. And the first stage of this is to constantly reflect on the structure of the song. Like, does everything flow well? Do you need to remove parts? Do you need to add transitions? Do you need to change notes or the harmony somewhere? And before continuing to progress a song forward through these next three stages, which I kind of see as being like the, the narrowing of getting to the final point, is you want to ask yourself if it's worth recycling through some of the previous stages. So if you're at this point and your song's amazing and you're like, yeah, let's move forward, you're good. But if you're at this point and you're second guessing your song or it feels like something's missing, maybe take the song and go back to flow and just come up with a bunch of new ideas. Or maybe take the song and start redeveloping motifs from extract. Or maybe you've lost sight of the whole vision of the tune and you go back to clarify and you design some new sounds and instruments, whatever it is. And all these stages can flow together. They can all link together, but it's just useful to think about it this way. So when you are ready, if you're feeling ready to move on, then with your composition, it's focusing on removing imperfection, okay, timing issues or questionable harmony. So if you have some stuff that's off rhythmically or the harmony is too much or you have too much information in the low end, um, this is the time to really think about it and like edit out stuff that doesn't have to be there or add subtle layers to reinforce a harmonic or melodic line or if you need to add transitions or you want to program in new parts that you couldn't have maybe played in before that's what happens in the edit phase okay and the the focus is to really fine-tune your music and bring it to a whole other level and again i think it's super powerful to focus on finalizing your track like be done with your track before moving on to the mix and if you followed any other of my trainings or just follow some pro mixing engineers, they will all tell you that 80% of the mix is done in these first four stages <laughs> that, that we've gone over. Okay, like getting your source sounds, getting good parts, getting good song arrangement, um, good performances. All of those things will contribute to an amazing mix more than processing techniques. Okay, the processing techniques and the cool tricks is maybe the last... 15%, but the vast majority of a good mix will come from an amazing production. Okay. So let's go ahead and move on to the mix, the almighty mix down. So the Zen of mixing. The reason why I call it that is that I really do believe that mixing phase, although it is very technical in nature with our frequencies and our EQs, our compression ratios, our saturation, our layers, parallel processing, automation, all this tracks, everything. There's a lot to think about, but you want to try and get to a place where you're in flow state. Okay. Because if you can be in flow state with the song while you're mixing it and you're adding effects, you're going to keep the vision of the whole song without getting lost in the sauce, which is so easy to do where you're like tweaking a snare EQ for hours, right? Which is just not making the music any better versus keeping the, the big picture in mind and working that way. Okay, so the focus, the problem that this solves is obviously not getting a pro sounding mix, overcomplicating the process. That is such a common problem that I've seen with many, many people. And then also not releasing music. If you don't know how to mix it or you're not feeling confident with your mixes, it's going to stop you from releasing it. And the focus is to first and foremost, identify and solve the sonic problems. Okay, so with your arrangement and your editing phase, Hopefully your arrangement is well done so that there isn't a ton of masking. But like if, for example, in the composition, there's like a ton of low end information in your bass and you have a sub and you have low notes on the piano and your vocal has like a bunch of low end frequency content, your whole low end is going to be a sea of mud versus if you really hyper focus on what parts are playing the bass at what parts of the song from an arrangement standpoint, it's going to make it like a thousand times easier to mix. So that's always something to keep in mind as you're finalizing your edit in the last stage. But let's say you have a good arrangement, you're ready to move it forward. At this point, it's like, okay, what are the problems? <laughs> Where are things not clear? Where are things not sounding like we want? And from there, then we address those problems first and foremost. Okay, because it's easy to get lost in solutions with mixing, like all these crazy effects and plugins and techniques and tricks and tips, all that kind of stuff. But it's like the most important thing to do first in a mix is to treat the problems. 
that are taking away from the song, okay, or being able to hear the song. Next is to discover how to best present the track, okay, because you can really, if you have a song arrangement, you could mix it in many different ways, okay? You could have the drums and the vocal up in front and everything else in the background, or you could have that the melodic elements are kind of more in front and the drums and the rhythm stuff is more in the back. There's a lot of ways you can present a song with a mix. So you want to think about what's the best way to present this song and like look at it almost like you're a mixing engineer dissolving yourself from being the artist. And then finally, you want to enhance the song for maximum impact on the listener. So this is when you whip out your fancy effects and your techniques to really make things pop and have a really cool sound through your speakers. So again, this stage is all about shaping, refining, and combining all your tracks into one single track. Okay, and it's a careful and subtle refining process, but again, never forget, one does not simply fix it in the mix. A good mix will not make a bad song good. <laughs> you have to already be working with a good song that sounds great. If you've never gotten your hands on a pro production, like a pro tracked song from a band or an artist you like and like the stems of what it sounds like before it's mixed, I really encourage you to do that because you'll be blown away by how amazing it already sounds before even mixing. And that's the key to getting an amazing mix is that it already is 80% of the way there. And then you're just taking it and making it pop for that last, whatever, 10, 10, 15%. You want to balance your levels, give room to all your instruments, enhance the sounds and effects, but you want to have the mindset of a mixing engineer. Again, you want to see beyond the technical details in order to best connect with the song and bring out the most energy out of it. Because at the end of the day, okay, at the end of the day, if we zoom out from getting lost in the sauce and all the technical details of mixing, at the end of the day, 99% of people who listen to that song will not care what you did. They won't even be thinking about it. They won't be thinking about the snare or the EQ or the compressors or like what reverbs or effects you have, the automation tricks, all that kind of stuff. Nobody cares about it. All they care about is how the song makes them feel from what's coming out of the speakers, okay? And as a mixing engineer, you want to focus on that first and foremost because that's the most important thing, okay? And then the, like the 1% of people who are actually mixing engineers might notice the extra stuff, but never let the extra stuff eclipse the maximum imp impact for the listener. Okay, again, you must be a master of your tools, not a slave to them. So let's move on to this final stage here. Boom, master. All right, art is never finished, only abandoned. That is a true quote, because when you're working on stuff and you're finishing your music, most likely, you won't feel like it's ready. You won't feel like it's done. You're going to be like, ah, oh, there's still this and this and this. I don't know. It doesn't feel like I'm ready to finish this. And this is a good quote that encapsulates that. Okay. Is that sometimes we just have to let go in order to grow. So the art of finishing. So the problem that this stage solves is that perfectionism. All right. Hyper obsessing over one track for months. I used to do that. And it's diminishing returns. You're working against yourself because in the time that you've spent hyper-focusing on one track, you could have probably done another two or three tracks. And by doing those other two or three tracks, the last track you d you've done will probably be like 50% better than the mix you're hyper-focusing on or the track you're hyper-focusing on. The problem, not releasing music, right? Or no one listening to your music because you haven't released it. The focus is testing it on multiple speaker systems. You'll also do this with your mix, but monitors, headphones, car speaker, laptop speakers, your phone speaker, does it sound good? There's a bunch of technical stuff that I can get into in another video that you wanna make sure that you're hitting with your master. And again, this stage is where you get the final product, just like that bottling of the wine. You get it in a medium where other people can experience it and it's consistent no matter where they experience it okay so if like if it was a bottle of wine and you sent it to a restaurant in italy and somebody tastes it it's going to taste just as good and consistent as if they bought it from the liquor store down the street okay imagine that with your master and mastering done properly should be definitely the most subtle of all the stages okay because you've done all the hard work at this point you've done the coming up with ideas, arranging a song, editing it to perfection and like mixing and really focusing on that. This is just that last final tweak to hit a couple 
things to make sure that it's consistent and then letting go and releasing it. You could also hire a mastering engineer. I still do that with uh, bigger releases, but if you've got to master your own track, it should definitely be one of the subtle, subtle phases. And you want to zoom out and experience the music as one thing. Okay. No more thinking about the drums versus the vocal versus the, the guitar layers and the synths. Try to look at it as one thing, one piece of music where everything's working together, which is a different perspective than the mixing where you are still focusing on all your tracks, right? And then at the end of the day, you want to call something finished, okay? And then you can release the music and navigate the industry and start building a business or sharing it with others or whatever your music goal is. Then you can do it because you finished something. And again, finishing something is the best way to get better at all of these stages, because going through all these stages, they all interconnect and you're going to start to see where you're strong, where you still need to work and how to adjust and tweak these things to fit a process that works for you. Okay, so I hope that was valuable. Walk through workflow wizardry. That's what I teach in my course. That's what I teach my students and my clients. If you want to grab this Notion template, definitely check out the link down below or shoot me a DM if you have any questions about this whole process. I love talking about this stuff. So again, I hope that was valuable and let me know down in the comments what you think of workflow wizardry and developing your creative process. All right. So we'll talk to you later.